when I first started getting involved in um, international major open source uh, projects, uh, the first project I got involved with was South, which was a library for Django, which was back then very important. Uh, and from that, I got into uh, other projects. I became a, a Django core contributor. And um, the person who basically welcomed me into that community, the author of South, was Andrew Godwin. Um, Andrew um, went later to um, write the migration frameworks in, within Django and the, uh, now the channels framework for uh, more advanced communications. Um, he's uh, uh, also a certified pilot. And um, he will now tell us about We Have Control. And uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, and thank you to everyone here at Python Israel. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be the opening keynote uh, this morning. So this talk is titled, You Have Control, uh, Lessons from Aviation. As Shai mentioned, I'm a, a licensed pilot. I fly small planes around California, mostly. But I am a few other things. I'm a Django core developer. Um, I am most well known for my work on South, migrations, and channels inside Django. I am also a senior software engineer at the company Eventbrite. We do ticketing and online sales, that kind of thing. And in general, I just like doing far too much difficult networking stuff in Python. It's kind of a problem I have. Before we start, I want to have a brief content warning. Um, if you are sensitive to aviation accidents, car accidents, or discussions of death, this presentation contains all three of those things. So just be aware, and it's entirely all the way through. I like to be a bit upfront about that stuff. But let's start with software. Software is difficult. Uh, you wouldn't all be here doing this probably if it was easy. And to think about how it's difficult, let's first start with one of my favorite blog series, which is called Things I Won't Work With uh, by Derek Lowe. Derek is a industrial chemist by trade. And this is a sort of a blog series in the online journal Science Mag. And he goes into excruciating detail about chemicals he just won't work with. Here's my first favorite quote. This is about a thing called, and let me read this out properly, hexanitrohexisoworzetane, I think. Um, he describes this as uh, so explosive that mixing it with TNT makes it more stable, um, which is an impressive thing. And then my, my, my other most favorite thing here is um, it's something called uh, in this case, it's a, it's a fluoride-based thing that will set literally anything on fire. So a reader writes in and says, hey, like, is there a substance that I can't even put the fire out with sand? And he's like, this substance will not only put the sand on fire, it will also burn through solid concrete and solid metal for about 25 meters before it stops. And so he has this wonderful set of blog posts about all these different chemicals and stuff he just won't work with. And I've kind of built this up over my career as well. There are certain things I just find difficult. Unicode, of course. Uh, we have locales. I'm sure everyone's here familiar with that stuff. Uh, time, just don't deal with it. It's terrible. Uh, time zones especially. Calendars, I mean, especially here in Israel, you're very familiar with having two calendar systems. Um, geography, no, I just, no, none of that, please. And money as well. Um, all of these are just on my list of things I try not to work with. Um, which unfortunately leaves me quite unemployable at the end of the day, but you know, that's how these things go. And, and this, you know, this is a, a bit of a silly list, and like every time I have a problem with these, I, I add it to the joke list of things I won't work with, which is now most of computer science. But there are other things that are actually genuinely difficult. Um, things like network latency. When I was a beginning programmer, one of the most difficult things to understand was things weren't just on or off, they could be there but very slow. And a lot of the first bugs you find with network programming are things like, oh, well, it's there, but it takes five seconds to respond. And all of your code that checks it's up says, oh, yeah, it's definitely up. We can send it stuff. But unfortunately, it just takes too long, it backlogs, and you get these really weird pileup errors. That's also true of hardware. Hardware is notoriously unreliable. One of my favorite facts is in modern computers, so let's say you've got a laptop, like I have here, has 32 gigabytes of RAM in it. 
With 32 gigabytes, the chance of a cosmic ray flipping a bit, it happens about once an hour. Like, it's that unreliable that, re like, probably while I'm going to talk on stage, at least one bit of memory in my laptop will flip from zero to one, and I can't do anything about it. It's just radiation that happens to hit that precise part of the memory. It's also true of hard drives. SSDs, in particular, are incredibly unreliable if you power them off. If you take an SSD, put it on a shelf for two years and come back, like a good tenth of that hard drive will have started to degrade significantly at that point. Then you have things like deadlocks, like all these things that as you start out programming, you just don't understand. Bit flips, like I just said, ambiguous specifications. Who here has had an ambiguous specification? Yeah, there we go. Some honest people putting their hands up there. Um, and of course, everyone's favorite, no documentation. Uh, I, I'm glad to say in Django, we are not guilty of the last one, at least. Um, it's not perfect, but it is at least a lot of it, and it's there. Now, and these problems, they are familiar to all of us, but they are not unique to software. A lot of these are engineering problems, especially specifications is a big engineering problem. And software encounters them quicker. Like, as software engineers, we have the luxury of moving at the fastest speed. We have all these ways of testing stuff quickly and writing it quickly that, like, a mechanical engineer would love to have the ability we have to rip open things and look inside. Imagine if you could just take an engine and look inside the middle of a piston without even disassembling it. Like, we have all that power. But we have problems. We are a young discipline. Software engineering has only been around for around 40 or 50 years. And there are other engineering disciplines that are as complex as us that have solved a lot of our problems. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go through some of those problems that the other industry has solved, in this case, aviation, and how we can learn from those problems and make our software better for us and for our users. So let's start with the scope of the problem. A Boeing 747, which in, in my opinion will always be the best plane, um, has six million individual parts. That is, if you're not aware, a lot. And given it has six million parts, those planes have a 0.000006% accident rate. They are, in fact, so reliable that they beat uh, cars and even walking. Um, it is far more dangerous to walk to the airport than it is to get on a plane when you get there. The only thing safer I could find and this is in terms of um, uh, passenger hour, so like in terms of hours you're on the thing, is a train. Trains are very slightly safer. And I'll remind you, trains run on tracks and can stop if there's a problem. If a plane has a problem, it can't just pull over and stop. It has to keep going. And what's interesting is these statistics are not just from making the technology better. Sure, planes are amazing pieces of technology. They're full of intricate systems and redundancies. But the people matter, honestly, more than the machine does. Aviation accidents are, by and large, mostly caused by pilot error. And we'll go into this later on, but pilot error is, like for us, user or developer error. And it's not a thing you just have to deal with. It's a thing you can build around and build for and understand, rather than just having to accept as a fact of life. Now, of course, the reason that mechanical is so small here is because we've made the planes that much better. But we have made amazing improvements in the last 20, 30 years with people's training for pilots and cabin crew to make things much more survivable. So let's look at some of those aviation principles. I have six here uh, in the presentation and how we can take them and apply them to our software. So first off is hard failure. This is maybe my most important principle. It's why it's the first one. If something is wrong in an aircraft, even if it's slightly wrong, it turns itself off. There is no soft failure. There's no partial state. It's a case of saying, well, if the compass reads slightly unreliably, then if it's electrical, it will just go and turn itself off. If it is a mechanical one, you're trained as a pilot, just put some paper over it so you don't even look at it. Once a thing has been proven to not be trustable, that you don't basically understand it even a little bit, you eliminate it entirely from the system. This is true of autopilots, of engines. If an engine is even slightly wrong, the plane doesn't even try and take off. It says, nope, engine's not there, we're gonna stop and, and try again. 
the autopilot, if it has even the slightest error, will just disconnect itself and hand control back to the pilot. Now, of course, this only works because we have redundancy. Every one of these systems that can turn itself off has a backup, and often the backup also has a backup. And because you have this stuff, it means that when something has a problem, it turns itself off, it's very obvious to you, the pilot or engineer on the plane, and then you can land or stop taking off, fix the problem and keep going. It's very obvious that it's a problem and it's very obvious you need to fix it. Now, how many of you have said phrases like this? We're like, well, we have some errors, but we're just gonna ignore them so the site keeps working. We're just gonna keep the errors going. Like there's some invalidation, but we'll just, we'll just save it and fix it later. This is a very common thing. Um, early in my career, I did a lot of this kind of coding. It saves you time now, and it wastes so much time later on. You'll end up with data that like, especially with data, I once got a data set that was so corrupt that the geographic points said that there were several, it was, it was for football pitches in the UK. Uh, several football pitches were in uh, Russia. Um, several of them were in Antarctica, and at least two were about 55 miles off the North Pole, which, uh, in case you're not aware, is impossible. So that's the kind of thing you have to try and avoid. And especially with errors, it's one of those things where if you have an error and you just suppress it, it's a perfect way to ensure you're never going to see it and never going to fix it. And by not knowing it's there or by forgetting about it, it's going to get worse and worse and build up over time. And it might not cause an accident by itself, it might be harmless, but one of the big things you're taught in aviation in the first 10 hours or so is that accidents and incidents, basically issues that happen, they never have a single cause. They're never that simple. There's always a collection of different things that goes in to make an accident. If a pilot happens to say, crash an aircraft into the ground, it's probably not just that the pilot was lazy or tired or something. It's probably like, oh, an instrument failed and the pilot was too tired to notice and there was low clouds they descended, like all these factors come in. And every time you ignore an error or make something f have a soft failure, you're adding to that list of potential things that can mix in and cause a problem. And the best part is when you have so many of them, you just can't predict what it will be. And so one of the things I like to say with software is if you have a problem, just fail hard. Raise an error, raise an exception. If you look at most of my code these days, if it even gets into a state it's not even quite sure about, it raises an exception in Python and lets our error locking software handle it. Because at work especially, we handle a lot of money every day. I do not want to say, oh, well, it turns out all of our um, prices have been off by two cents for the last two years. Whoops, we owe like $55 million. Like that's what you don't want. And so make sure you validate things, make sure you have those hard errors. And one of these things is deploying often as well. Every time you deploy, you have all these new things you've written exposed to the world for the first time. And you're saying, hey, is this okay? If you deploy once a month, the number of things you're putting out there at once is huge. And the number of ways they can interact and fail gets bigger. The slower you deploy, the more likely your deploy will fail. If you deploy quickly and often and do it all the time, like we, you know, we maintain planes every 100 hours sometimes, just to make sure it's okay, you have a much lower likelihood of things going wrong on any individual deploy. And if it does go wrong, the list of things it could be is very, very narrow. You know what thing it could have been. And then the one last part of this is that People often say, oh no, that's a single point of failure. It's terrible, we must remove it. Well, mm, yeah, they, I've come around on this in the last five years or so. Single points of failure can be good if you do them right. Here is an example of, of what I'm talking about. Let's say we have everyone's favorite thing in the web these days, which is microservices, um, and we have a couple of them on a thing on the left here called a message bus. Now, a message bus is a single point of failure. Every single service talks to that bus and pushes stuff through it. If the bus goes down, the entire site goes down. On the right-hand side here, we have a peer-to-peer -peer architecture where everything talks to each other. Now, this initially seems better. If something goes down, then everything else is unaffected. The problem is, look at the number of lines. There is, I think, I'm, I'm not good at doing 
two to the power of uh, eight in my head, around 32 uh, lines in that diagram, potentially. That means there's 32 individual things you have to watch, you have to monitor, and you have to be able to fix. And if one of them goes down, I'm pretty sure your site's going to stop working in some mysterious fashion if one part can't talk to another. You don't know which one it is, but it's one of those things. And so a single point of failure actually helps you by having a single thing that you can have expertise in. You can be very sure that you know how to fix it, that you know you can monitor it. You can be, have a good team of engineers watching it all the time. And of course, you have a backup of it. You don't have one of them. And this kind of comes into alerting. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, videos of cockpits or audio or recordings, or at one point in your life seen something where the plane's making bing noises or going ding or beeping at pilots. One of the things we discovered around 30 years ago is that having too many alarms in a cockpit is very bad. It causes what's called alert fatigue. Um, cockpits generally have only three or four different noises and the noises are rated from the plane is gonna crash to someone's bringing you food. And so the food one is like a lovely soft noise. And there is also like, there's user experience concerns in designing noises. Like the noises are meant to, be, are meant to sound worse and worse as it's more and more difficult to, to recover from them. So the, the noise for someone wants to talk to you is like, a, a like ding. it's very pleasant, very lovely. And then the, the like warning horn for an engine is on fire is this awful buzzing noise that you can't possibly ignore. Um, one of my favorite things as an aside is there is a great video recording of alert noises for nuclear plants and they are designed to be specifically haunting and scary so that if you hear them you feel the need to run away it's a fascinating part of design but this comes around to things like like those different noises we've grouped in cockpits all the notifications in basically like it's fine it's maybe a problem it's definitely a problem and like pilots can train for those three things and understand them and react to them properly. And this is true of you and your engineers and everyone as well. Alert fatigue is a very, very real thing. How many of you have had emails arrive in your inbox so often you just start to ignore them? I mean, I certainly have. Yeah, look, half of the room at least put their hands up there. Like, this is alert fatigue. This is a standard thing. Like, humans are very good at ignoring things that happen to them a lot. And if you start to ignore them, then it gets worse. An error that you get sent once a day is as good as not having that error sent to you at all. You may as well just turn it off. And this comes to a second point. Never put errors in the same place. You should never have the critical errors and the, oh, there's a slight problem, happen in the same inbox, in the same page. There should be a very obvious way of, hey, this is a really important thing and you're, you're gonna see it on a channel, let's say a, a mobile phone, that almost never happens. If it's a place that never ever has a message and you get one, you'll be like, aha, this is unusual, and my brain's gonna react to it well. And this is kind of the thing I'm saying. So let's have, for example, three levels, critical, normal, and background. This is a pretty standard thing I try and force slash adopt on my projects. Critical is basically someone has to be woken up. It's an actionable thing. Let's say that the disk is full in our database. That is a case where like, someone has to be woken up, and crucially, it's actionable. You can do something about it. If you have a problem that no one can actually solve, don't send an alert. It's pointless. You're just making them worry for no reason. Always have a way to make something get better. Always have alerts be fixable. So critical wake somebody up. Normal. It shouldn't wake somebody up. It should go into a nice thing when you get into work the next morning, be like, okay, we have these quite bad errors that aren't, they're not great, but they're not terrible. We'll fix them this week. And then you have background errors. Um, I've seen a lot of projects. Um, in fact, when I, when I joined work, I opened my email inbox and immediately started getting like 55 messages an hour um, from all these background processes, from all these things telling us stuff. And these are things that should not be error messages or emails, they should be metrics. If I want to know how many payments have failed, like we have a lot of payments go through every hour, I don't want an email per payment, I want a graph saying, oh, this hour 45 of them failed. And that way you can see if the graph spikes or dips, there's, there's changes. You're not concerned about individual points on that graph. You're not concerned about individual failures because you're working at big scale. And this is especially true, if you ignore an error for weeks, if you just, even if it's one of these potentially normal ones, 
if you ignore it for weeks and no one's complaining, maybe that feature's not that important. Maybe you should just turn it off. Um, I have found several features on various projects that haven't worked for, oh, let's say, a month or two, and I've gone, okay, in that case, I'm going to delete this feature and no one's going to notice because it's already broken. It's a great way of finding out stuff that people basically just don't want. Number three is knowing your limits. Now, this again is a thing where people often, and this is true of me as well, are too optimistic, they're too positive. I hate to tell you this, but everything's going to fail. We're all going to die. Um, <laughs> you have to know when. This is a big thing in aviation too. Um, initially, when they were making planes in the First World War and the Second World War, they were like, ah, oh, well, the, we're looking at planes that came back and we can see they did very well, so we'll keep building these designs. And then what one of the engineers noticed was he started looking at the planes that came back and where the bullet holes were. And wherever the bullet holes were in the planes, they didn't put armor. Wherever the bullet holes weren't, they put extra armor. And this may seem counterintuitive, but the point being that the planes that got back with bullet holes, well, the thing that has holes in it probably isn't that important. The planes that didn't come back are the ones that got shot in the places that are important. So wherever there's not holes, where well, you have to reinforce the plane more. And this is true of modern planes today. It's much less about bullets. Um, this is a picture of a 787 in the Boeing test factory. Um, this is a rig that is bending the wings of that plane until they snap. Uh, every plane pretty much built today undergoes this test. Um, at least three or four planes go through this test. They are going to ruin this plane. This plane is gonna, never going to fly. They built it just to do this to it. Um, those wings get to around 55 degrees before they snap. The reason they're doing this is they want to know what that number is. They want to know that it is 55 degrees or 50 degrees because the design for the plane is the wind should flex to about 20 degrees. Like that's, that's the most, like a big thunderstorm, the plane's meant to flex, that's how they stay in the air well. Um, so that if you see it happening to a plane, don't worry, it's fine, it's designed to do that. Um, but they know that their margin of error is over double. They know the plane can take so much more than the worst thunderstorm that has ever happened on planet Earth, that it's fine. And this is also true of software. You have to think like, what can you take? What can you stress your stuff to do before it breaks? And it's not just true of web stuff, also of data science and ingestion. Is there a limit to the way your system can, can work? Have you built it for a certain size of data, especially? Um, experimental validation relies on this stuff. And one of my favorite things to compare here is what's called a minimum equipment list. So every plane ever built has one of these now, um, and is a list of parts of the plane that if it's broken, you can't take off if it's broken. Things that aren't on the list, if they're broken, the captain goes, well, we probably don't need the coffee machine, we'll take off. Um, but things that are broken, that are on the list, have to be stopped for. And it's a slightly strange list. Um, lavatory ashtrays are on the required list. By, by federal law in America, if the ashtray on the lavatory is not working, you cannot take the plane off. And you may think, that's weird, planes are non-smoking these days. They are, but people will still smoke. And the point is, if somebody's got a cigarette and they're trying to smoke illicitly, what you want to do is still give them a place to put it out. What you don't want them to do is put it on the carpet or in the bin full of paper in the, in the bathroom or any one of these wonderful flammable things. And so having them there is actually a fire requirement for the plane. Air conditioning, it may seem like a, like a pleasant thing. I remind you at 30,000 feet, the pressure is unbreathable. It's about minus 50, 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, it is a life support system at that point. And of course, seatbelt signs because laws and regulations. Curiously, um, the fuel caps are not required. Uh, I think this is from the uh, 787, maybe 747 list. Uh, I was very surprised by this until I learned that fuel caps are more, they're more of a tidy thing. The actual fuel system has an anti-vacuum design in it, so it doesn't suck the fuel that anyway. Um, on my plane, fuel caps are definitely needed. Uh, it just spills out otherwise. And the weather radar. Weather radar is lovely, but if it's not there, you can just do the thing where you look out of the windscreen and you can see the clouds. Um, your, your trains go, that's a thunderstorm, we should probably not fly into that. It's a very key skill pilots have. <laughs> and this is one of the things that you should be thinking about for your systems, right? Like, 
not just building lists of things like this, like what do you need to run the site? Um, for example, like Eventbrite, we have services. Some services are critical to the site. We can't sell tickets without them. Some services, uh, we can live without them for, for a couple of hours. They're not critical. For example, we have a service that does search and discovery on the site that powers our search pages and discovery stuff. And like, I want to find events in Tel Aviv, enter, it does all that stuff. It's an important service, but we can lose that service for a few hours and the search goes down, but ordering tickets still works. And that's the kind of thing we want to have in our designs. And then part of this is, called, is the wing stretching. You should know when your site breaks. One of the things we're doing now is every new service we write, we load test it to normal load and make sure it's fine. And then we just keep going. We just keep adding more and more workers to our locust cluster and go, at what point will this start just hilariously falling over and not working? Um, the week, actually last week before I flew out here, I was talking to a colleague of mine, he was load testing. He got to 10 times the normal load on a thing before it started failing. And that's where we're like, okay, we're pretty happy with that. Like 10 times normal load, we're not gonna see that. That's a good margin of error. So we know we have that gap. And fuzz testing is part of this too. If you're not familiar, fuzz testing is basically just sending random data to your system to see what breaks it. Often, um, this especially includes like bad Unicode data, breaks things in amazing ways. Our label printing was broken in a very bad way by Unicode for a long time. And so part of this is like, it's not just setting like, how many people you can throw, but also what kinds of things. Can it take one megabyte strings? If it falls over, why? Maybe you should not take one megabyte strings. Can people's names be mixtures of unprintable characters? All that kind of thing. And it's key to remember, no one is perfect. You don't have to be perfect at this stuff. We are engineers, we're not, we're not scientists. Engineering is the discipline of making things work quite well, but not perfectly. Um, we all deal with compromises and trade-offs. Our job is to make things work given constraints, given a limited amount of time and money. And so you don't have to sit down and build a thing to be perfect. In fact, that's probably the wrong approach. Your goal is to build it good enough for now. Think about what your user's gonna be, your load's gonna be, build it to that kind of scale, and then revisit it. Like, have that number, know that, okay, we can do, let's say, 300 requests a second. And then when, you know, in two years, you're up to like 150 a second as a normal part of things, you go, okay, we've got closer to the number we know our limit's at, we can revisit, re-engineer, do that work now, rather than wasting time earlier, and then fix it. And that's one of the ways of doing technical debt in a very good way, is knowing when to make things have changes. Risk is perfectly fine when you're informed. Pilots deal with risk on a daily basis. Uh, one of the things we're trained to do is to be very realistic about what we're doing. Um, one of the reasons I warned you about death and stuff in the beginning is that the, the last section of this presentation has a lot of that in it. One of the first things I saw when I went to my pilot training school in London, you walk in, it's a lovely reception area full of people looking very busy and having bags full of headsets and things. And there's a table with magazines on it. And the magazines aren't like Gardener's World or Time, all the sort of normal magazines you might find in the UK. They're all aviation accident report magazines. Every magazine is full of awful accidents that may have killed people and a very detailed breakdown of how it happened and, and what went wrong. And one of the things we're trained to do is that like flying is a naturally dangerous thing. You don't just go up in the air in a small metal tube by accident. Like it, there's things can go wrong. And we're not trained to ignore the risk. You're trained to understand the risk and to take it. And as long as you know what they are and how they happen, that's fine. Unknown risks are the most dangerous thing in the world. If a pilot has an unknown risk, if they don't know something, they will refuse to take off because it could be a tiny thing, it could be a huge colossal thing. Like if there's a light they don't understand that's off, they will call an engineer, and I really hope the engineer knows, right? And if the engineer doesn't know, they're definitely both gonna say this plane's not gonna fly until somebody who knows what this light means is coming over here and telling us what it means. Because the light could mean, I don't know, the plane needs extra water topping up, but it could mean the engine's about to fall off. Um, hopefully it's not a light for that, but you know, you never know. And this kind of brings into the fourth principle. And that is to build for failure. Failure, as I said previously, always happens. And even if you don't think it'll happen to you, 
it will happen eventually. And what we do with planes is we don't build them assuming the plane's going to work really good. We're like, oh yeah, we're going to everything will be fine. The plane's going to work fantastically. Um, we're going to have one of everything. It'll be lovely. We assume every single thing in a plane is going to fail every time it takes off. And this is why no single thing in that plane can fail and take it down. And especially as software engineers, we are very, very bad at this. Like we'd love it to be the case that if our, if our code fails, it did this. But in actuality, a lot of us don't practice this kind of building for failure. I certainly am guilty of this, right? Like I build code assuming things are gonna work well. I should be spending most of my time assuming things are gonna work badly. How do I recover? How do, what happens when things go down? And without practice, without training yourself to do this, it's often very easy to forget about it. For example, here's three things that are very useful, not necessarily daily practices, but ways of testing what you have right now. The first one, um, Netflix made famous with their chaos monkey. Um, just kill, kill stuff randomly. Just go and like start unplugging servers. Um, there are a few companies I've heard of where literally like the system and the sysadmins would go into the data center, just browse through the racks and go, oh, that one, and just pull power cables out of the racks. Just like semi-randomly, wouldn't even warn the engineers. And the point being, if the software is written correctly, that's not a problem, it recovers. If it's not written correctly, you get an error and then you can plug it back in and recover quickly rather than having that error happen in a way you don't know. Because you're controlling the environment, when you're killing things off yourself, you can unkill it and, and restore it very quickly, but you've got that information about, well, for those 10 seconds, everything went down, right? Like, it turns out like, like you know, unplugging this cable killed all of our payment processing. Why did it do that? I shouldn't be able to do that. And that's true also of network failures. Like, power loss is one thing, um, a lot of power loss situations have happened in the past. I've seen whole data centers lose power. Um, that's often a thing you can't recover from. But network failures are far more common. Like unplugging ethernet cables is a great way of um, doing this. And not just in, in person, like if you're on cloud hosting, which a lot of people are these days, just, you know, put the firewall up for like 10 seconds. See if, it, see if anything breaks. Just like start slicing off access and like practice those kind of things happening. One of the best things you can do, in fact, is the third thing here, which is unreliable connections. One of my favorite situations for um, mobile apps failing is when you're on the London Underground. Now, the Underground has Wi-Fi in stations, not in the tunnels. And so the train has Wi-Fi, and then it has two minutes in the tunnels without Wi-Fi, then has it again. The number of apps I tried to use on that train that couldn't deal with the network doing this all the time was far too high. Um, it's like trying, trying to order takeaway to my f apartment on the way back on the train of like, the app will like try and place the payment and then the network will cut out, it'll get confused and come back again. And this is not just true on, like in Lon like London is a developed country, in places with like bad internet or slow internet, this is even worse. A lot of engineers, especially in Silicon Valley, they're, they're the worst at it develop on these like huge high bandwidth links with loads of space and don't think about people on like restricted internet or high latency. Um, one of my favorite uh, things I did, I gave a talk in Australia where I talked about this and everyone in the room was like, oh, thank goodness. Because Australia is so far away from everybody else. Um, it's, it's like a hundred millisecond minimum ping from anywhere else in the world to Australia. And they are constantly on the, on the receiving end of all these awful network designs of like, well, we're going to make the page load 55 things at startup. In Australia, loading 55 things takes like five seconds, right? It's not like half a second like it is elsewhere. And this kind of comes into training too. Um, a large majority of the training I've done as a pilot, I did two courses. I did a private course, sort of basic plane training. <laughs> And then what's called instrument training, which is flying in clouds. It's basically like you can't see out the front. It's all sort of just, when you're in clouds, it's perfectly white. So you just fly with just the instruments on the dashboard. A good 75% of all my training is emergency handling. Like the first part is like, yeah, you know, here's a plane. You turn left, you turn right, go up, go down. Pretty simple. Most people get the hang of that in the first 10 hours of training. They can fly the plane pretty well. And then the nasty thing happens which is your, your instructor starts taking the engine down. It's like, like you're just, just flying along, 
instructor goes and just sort of reaches out and pulls the throttle to idle so the engine's not useful anymore. Goes, okay, land, land the plane. Like you're just over the middle of the Eng England at this point. Like there's a field. It's like, yeah, land it. And you're expected to have the skills in that situation to take the plane, put it into a glide configuration so it doesn't go down too fast, scan for a good field, line the plane up, and then land in the field. Now, of course, what you do is you almost land in the field, then you put the power back in and go and do this and scare some cows along the way. Um, many farmers in, in Norfolk and England have these planes going all the time and they get a little bit annoyed. Um, but the point is we're trained for it. Um, this happened to me once in real life over the San Francisco Bay. Um, the, engine started, the engine started running rough, um, quite near an airport, thankfully, but I wasn't concerned. I'd been through this so many times. I practiced it so often, it's automatic. I just sat there, did the right configuration, and just did the right thing. And this is true of your stuff too. If you have software that people depend on, a large part of that should be practicing emergencies. Especially if you're an operations team, or a DevOps team, or an SRE team, this is your job. And part of it is training and memorization, um, and part of it isn't. As a pilot, you're trained to memorize the things that are important to do immediately. So for example, in that situation of, oh no, my engine's gone out, there are three things I know to do immediately, and then I look at this, which is my checklist. The checklist has this large, very obvious red ring section, which is called, helpfully, emergencies. Um, there are three pages of these, um, and that's for a tiny plane. The 747 one about, is about this thick. And it details every possible emergency you could have and how you fix it. And so, for example, uh, you can see on the screen, engine fire in the air. It tells you how to put the engine out. Um, in particular, the thing to do with an engine fire, which is counterintuitive, is a high-speed dive um, because that puts the fire out. It feels wrong, though. Don't, it's very strange. Um, but the key thing is, these are the things you might forget. And so it's like, make sure you've done this stuff. And having checklists is a very easy way of having something that's not automated, but not manual. Things you don't do often enough to write scripts for or have a machine do it, you should have checklists for. They, I have them in my personal life. Like when I pack to go to other countries, I have a travel checklist, which has all the things that I've forgotten at one point or another. Uh, my very first trip to America, I forgot a phone charger, which is uh, very bad. And so that's like the first thing I'll notice now is phone charger. Um, and like really, like don't rely on your memory. Humans are not good at mem remembering things. It's been proven in the lab that people often like confuse things or misremember them. Especially in a stressful situation, that gets even worse. And if you practice that failure and practice the checklists, you're going to be ready when the bad thing happens, right? Like, for example, you know, running an e-commerce site, we're particularly susceptible to this. We want to be ready for, hey, something big happened, the whole site is down, all of our payments and stuff have stopped. That's a situation we want to practice for and be ready for when it happens. Have a disaster recovery plan, that kind of thing. Like, remember, like, a lot of big tech companies have their offices literally on top of one of the biggest earthquake faults in the world. Like, if the San Andreas fault goes off, most tech companies have something along that line of the fault. It's going to not be a great time. And so make sure people in other countries can do stuff too. And this comes back to those accident causes. Remember I said that like over three quarters of accidents are caused by the pilot. And this is kind of one of those things. Um, a lot of it is not being prepared enough, but also a lot of it is bad communication. And so this is where I go into a little bit of a uh, non-technical part. And I say that with stress, like it's not non-technical. Good engineering requires good communication. You cannot build complex software without a big team. The name of this presentation comes from this particular phrase. Um, when you're flying an aircraft with two pilots, which is pretty common in commercial things and also when you're training, you never just give control to somebody else. You say things like this, you say, you have control. The other person then says, I have control. And then you then say for a third time, you have control. What this does is it shows that both pilots are aware of what's happening. The other pilot says, yes, I've, I've heard you, I'm gonna take the wheel. And then the second pilot says, yes, I, I heard that you heard me and then I can let go of it. Before we did this, often people are like, you have control and they just walk out of the cockpit. And if the other person hasn't heard you, it's not good. 
Um, they go, that's strange. And, oh, and I have to like grab the thing and keep going. And so this is one of those key things. Like a lot of communication stuff in aviation came around in about the 1960s, 1970s. Um, this is the part of aviation history where a lot of accidents were caused by captains being very like, oh, I'm a captain, I'm very important. I can ignore my, ignore my second officer and just fly the plane. And they kept flying it into terrain, it was terrible. And so it's very important to have communication even in that situation. And software is even more complex. Um, like at work, I work in a team of around 300 engineers these days. And that's a, that's a medium sized team in engineering. Um, the big companies have even bigger ones. But even in a six or 12 person team, you have communications issues. And it does get worse as you grow. Um, so I used to work at a company called Lanyard. We had six people. And at six people, generally, you all kind of know what's happening with each other. You have this sort of situation where, yeah, like, I mean, there's like front end and back end. We all chat. We have tea together. It's all great. And as you grow, you have that same problem we had with the services earlier. It's a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So you get more lines of communications. Like, you have a few more meetings now. Like, we need to go and talk to this other team over here and see how they're doing. And then when you get really, really big, you end up having all your time in meetings and no time spent on anything else. Um, this is another case where like, having people who do that communication, having them be the message bus is very useful. This is what managers and project leaders and tech leads are for, is mostly for communicating well. Their job is to make this mess turn into a much more structured like hierarchy of things. And clear communication is really vital, specifications especially. If you don't know what other parts of your software is doing or what you're meant to be working towards, or even in the case if you're working, you know, if you're doing analysis on some data sets, if you haven't talked to people who made your data and know what the assumptions are, you're going to draw wrong conclusions. And the key thing is having in-person meetings works moderately well with small teams. As soon as you have more than like 10 people, write everything down. Pretty much everything that happens um, in aviation is written down. Uh, there's an old joke that planes don't run on jet fuel, they run on paper. Um, the amount of paperwork we filed is, is incredible. And this is true of software too. Like, if you write things down, you will have less meetings because things are written down. You can go and read them. Especially in our case, we have offices across um, from Madrid through to San Francisco. It's a nine hour time zone difference. There is no hour in the day when those offices are both working at once. We cannot have a meeting with both, people, both sets of people in them. Unless we write stuff down, we literally can't communicate with them very well. And this becomes worse and worse. It's also true if you don't speak English as a first language. Written English is often a lot easier to understand than spoken English. And you can translate it, you can take your time, you can read it again. It's very helpful for that stuff. And then the other thing about cockpits, which is chain of command. Now, in a plane, the captain is always in command. Um, in fact, in a, in a fun twist, the captain of a plane is always legally more responsible than the government. Um, they can do whatever they want until they land and then they can be arrested. Um, but while they're in the air, they have complete control. Um, if, there is, if the prime minister of the UK is on a plane and there's a captain as well, the captain has control. No, nobody outranks the captain on the plane. And the key thing here is it's very clear who makes the final decision. It's very clear that if there is a choice and neither option is good, and most choices are between two bad options, somebody can pick one. The number of times I've seen teams and managers who don't want to make a choice is far too high. And often they're like, we don't want to choose, not, we just don't want to change anything, and they just leave it alone. And that's a terrible way of doing things. Leaving things alone is a choice, and it's always, nearly always the worst choice. Um, if you're like, oh, we can land on the river, or we can land on the field, and they're like, we're just not going to land. Like, you can't do that as a choice. <laughs> you're going to land somewhere, um, and th this is true of software. Make decisions. And one of the things, um, as a junior engineer, I found difficult was like, I thought all of programming was this wonderful world of like, well, there's always a right answer. There's always a perfect solution. It's not true. This is engineering. It's trade-offs. It's compromise you will always be faced with a set of bad choices. The most important thing is to pick one, have a chain of command, people respect that picks that, and then do it. Um, one of the things I say was like, I don't care what option we choose. I, like, I, sli I may slightly prefer one option, but as long as we pick one and do it, consistency is what's important. Having that decision made is what I like. And that feeds into the final point. 
blame culture. This is unfortunately very prevalent in software engineering especially. How do I know all these stats, all these stories? Like I can tell you stories of, of the Gimli glider, which is the thing that like, they literally glided a 74, well, they glided a very large plane to land on an airfield in the middle of a, a, a car show in Canada. Um, I can tell you stories of the Hawaiian plane that had explosive decompression. All these famous stories in aviation, we know in incredible detail. We know what went wrong because every single time something goes wrong, it is investigated and reported upon. Every country in the world pretty much has an air accident investigation board. Um, we call ours the AAIB in the UK. It's very unimaginative. And like even in a small accident, they turn up, they take notes, they look at the things. Um, and they work out what happened. Like one of my favorite cases is in the UK, in one of the magazines I was reading, it's like, oh, well, this helicopter crashed and killed everyone inside off the coast of Scotland. Terrible accident, um, really unfortunate. But they worked out what happened by taking the engine and looking at the angle of the mud in the engine's housing to work out what angle the helicopter hit the ground and thus what kind of control it was in. They have that level of detail in reporting. And this is one of the things, like they look at everything because there is no blame culture. And this is because we know there is never a single cause of a problem. Sure, pilot error can be a big cause of issues, but it's always mixed with something else. If the pilot makes a mistake, the blame is always partially on the aircraft for letting the pilot do the thing that was wrong. And this is one of the things where if you have a problem, if you have a mistake that's made, make it very difficult to do again. So many times I've seen people make a mistake and gone, well, that's terrible, we just have to fire them now. No, you spent all that time in training that like, they will never make that mistake again. Your job is to make nobody else do it either. Um, a real life example I, I like from last year, uh, if you remember, um, Hawaii last year had a, everyone in Hawaii got woken up about 10 in the morning with this message. Um, telling them there was a ballistic missile inbound to Hawaii. Now, Hawaii has a missile alert system for, at this point, presumably North Korea. Um, and getting this message basically means you're all about to die. And quite rightly, everyone got a little bit uh, concerned. Um, and it turns out it was, a, it was a false alarm. Now, this is not a good false alarm. Like, this is a classic software design issue. Let me show you the issue. This is the admin site for the alerting system. Now, this here is the correct, but say that's the wrong button to press. That sends the real alert. This here sends the fake alert that no one ever sees. You may notice those two look incredibly similar and there's no confirmation on either of them. It just happens. And so the poor um, person in, involved in this, in this missile program just misclicked a thing that like, they probably just read most of the words that looks the same. It's not big and red. It's just a plain blue hyperlink on a page. And that's what caused the problem. Like this is a case of they, and I hope they're doing this, should take this page, redesign it, have a big red button that says, send a real message. And then it should go, are you sure? And you press, okay, I'm definitely sure. I'm gonna wake everyone up and make them think they're gonna die. Um, <laughs> because otherwise it's not good. <laughs> And again, like you only get, it's like you have reporting. If you don't encourage reporting, if you have a culture that blames and fires people, people are never going to tell you when they make a mistake. They're going to hide the mistakes. They're going to try and cover it up. Cover ups are worse often than the real thing. In covering up, they're going to make even more mistakes or make other people have problems. And it just becomes bad. It's not good. And so if you encourage reporting and encourage a culture where like if you make a mistake, you're not going to get fired. You're, just, you're, you're going to sit down, you're going to write it up, and we're going to fix it. Like, you know, if you break Eventbrite when you deploy at work, um, we roll the release back, we go, okay, it's not great. And you just get, you get a letter that says, hey, here's a form, fill out the form. The form says, how did it happen? Why did it happen? How do we stop it happening again? A very simple thing of like, okay, we're going to take the issue, we're going to address it, and then we're going to make sure we know what we're doing. And part of this too, is rewarding maintenance as well as firefighting. Firefighting, that is fixing bugs and all that kind of stuff, is very visible. It looks heroic. 
you always notice the person staying behind late to fix bugs, to do the right thing. They're not the right kind of people you want often. You want people who maintain well, people who write good code that's full of tests. They go, yep, it works, ship it and go home at five. Like that's the kind of people you want in your company. Some of the worst developers I've known are amazing firefighters because they're great at making bugs and then really good at solving bugs as well. But what if they didn't make bugs in the first place? Eh? Like that's, the, that's kind of the way it works. This, this, and that's kind of the, the other part of a blame culture. And so those are the six basic principles. And I want to talk a little bit about what this means for engineering as a discipline now as well. We have a phrase, which is, in aviation, every rule is written in blood. Um, every single one of the rules in the manual of a plane, in aviation law, pretty much every single, every single one of those, somebody has died to bring those rules to us. Um, it's a famous thing that, like, if an accident happens on a plane, it almost never happens again because the rule, because a rule gets put in place to stop it. For example, there's the case of um, a Hawaiian Airlines flight, um, one of the only cases of explosive decompression we've ever had. The entire front of the plane basically burst open, um, and unfortunately, one stewardess got sucked out and died. Everyone else survived, but one, one stewardess um, got killed. And they were incredibly concerned. They were like, this is terrible. Like, pla planes shouldn't explode, it turns out. They spent months and months in x-rays and doing scans of the plane and eventually found out that metal does not wear down the way they thought it did. They, the way they built the planes, the assumptions they'd made in the design of the metal was wrong. And they changed the rules and we've never had one since then. Like no plane since that accident has ever burst open in the same way along a seam. Like some windows have come out, of course, but windows is usually fine. And like software is not there yet, but we're not far off. Like we may think software is lucky and happy and, and does nice computers. Let's go through some examples of, of history of software working and not working. First off, one of my favorite stories of software working very well. Uh, this is Margaret Hamilton. Uh, she was the lead programmer for the Apollo program uh, that, that landed on the moon. And this, by the way, is the source code for the Apollo program. Uh, be glad you didn't have to do this with your code today. We have Git now. But the key thing is, Margaret Hamilton, um, she not only invented the term software engineering, she invented error recovery, pretty much. Um, the Apollo modules had the first real-time operating system that was basically ever developed. Um, there was the actual code which ran and did calculations, and then a backup watchdog program that in the case the main program froze, would restart and go to an emergency mode and just keep the basic stuff working. On descent to the moon, there was a problem with the radar dish. So the lunar lander has a radar on the bottom. The radar basically is telling it how far away the moon is. It's bouncing off to try and work out how, how far down it is. They hadn't ever tested that part before because they hadn't landed on the moon before, right? And that radar dish, the interrupts happened too frequently, overloaded the system. If it wasn't for the way Margaret designed this thing in, like, this had never happened before. She was planning ahead. She built for failure. She built a thing and like the, the system went, oh, that's strange. I'm being overloaded. I can't actually handle the inputs. Like it was ignoring the astronaut's controls because the computer was too busy with the radar. So it rebooted, put itself into emergency mode and then gave them basic control, like just thrusters and stuff. And they like had to manually land it on the moon. If it wasn't for that, they would have died. Um, so she managed to save them by just guessing and building the failure up front. That's unfortunately not true of this. Um, this is the Patriot missile system. Uh, it is a intercept missile system. It's designed, you put it around a base, there's a radar that tracks incoming threats and it intercepts and destroys the missile midair. Um, generally works pretty well these days, um, but famously uh, in the 90s, I think it was, it killed 28 people by not working. The reason it didn't work is they use floating point numbers. Um, if you left the system on for too long, the floating point numbers drifted out of sync with the time and it stopped thinking there was anything in the sky. And so when the real missile came in and hit a barracks and killed 28 soldiers, the system went, oh yeah, there's nothing in the sky. It's perfectly clear. Like the numbers don't line up. Like this small bug, like the system should have worked as it did, but the small oversight of floating point numbers managed to kill them. And you're sure that, that's military hardware. Military hardware is in a rough environment. This is medical hardware. This is the most famous one of all. This is Therac 25. 
Uh, Therac is one of the best reasons to never use software ever, and I say that lightly. Um, they thought, I know, let's make an x-ray machine that has an entirely software-controlled x-ray X -ray aperture that shoots the x-rays at people. Um, now, I know this is a bad idea, and we now know it is because they all still have hardware interlocks. At the time, it didn't. There was an integer overflow in Therac source code. They didn't find in testing. Um, they only found it in the field. And they killed three people by exposing them to lethal doses of x-rays. They, they, they severely disabled at least three more people. Um, we think over 20 people in total were somehow disabled by this machine because the software overflowed and gave them you know, 10 seconds rather than 0.1 seconds of x-ray exposure, which is, which is deadly. And then, of course, more recently, we have the Uber Autonomous Vehicle. Um, the NTSB report for this came out a couple of weeks ago. And it turns out the vehicle saw a pedestrian that it hit, and it chose not to stop. A piece of software went, yeah, we see an obstacle. There's definitely a person shape there. We're not going to stop. The person who wrote that source code is probably guilty of manslaughter. Um, I, I, I'm not a judge, but like, there's a high level of risk there. And the software that runs on that car is not simple. It's a huge stack of operating systems, of libraries. I imagine, in, like, of the open source people I know, at least some of their code is in that car. Like, software we build is built on all these layers, all these complicated sets of technologies. And we're not quite ready to deal with that yet. We haven't quite got that safety down that aviation has. It's not just true of like, all these big moving vehicle things. There are cases where, for example, uh, medical systems, like just form entry stuff can work wrong. I think it's a case in Germany where like, a system sent an email to a lady who said, that said, you have, like, it misdiagnosed, and, oh, you have syphilis, and so do your children. Um, it was wrong, it was entirely wrong. It was, a, it was a mistake, a bug in the system, but this caused her to commit suicide. And like that, even the small mistakes in basic applications can cause bad side effects. And so my, my ask of you is, don't do all this stuff. It's not things to sit down and go away and fix right now, but think about it. Make, like, think about the principles, think about how you build software, and try and have some of those ideas and keep them with you. Thank you very much.